I just uh, like to start out by saying that the executions at Marikana were a terrible tragedy, and I hope that through the process of political discussion, a little louder, please. I hope that through the process of political discussion, we'll be able to get justice for these workers someday. Okay. So I'm presenting on the Marikana Commission report. Uh, it's also known as the Falun Commission after the Chief Judge I. G. Falun. It met after the massacre from August 2012 until March 2015 when it finished its work. And then President Jacob Zuma delayed the release of the findings until May 2015 in order to limit the political damage. But the report was eventually released. Um, it won't surprise any of you to find out that the report absolved all the real criminals from political responsibility. But the report is still useful because we can find out a lot about what happened behind the scenes of the massacre. And then if we read between the lines, we can get a sense of what really happened, which in my opinion is that there was a conspiracy at the highest levels of the ANC, a deliberate conspiracy to break the strike using police violence. Okay, so the commission's job was to look at the role played by four parties in the massacre. Uh, one of them was Nomi Management, um, the two unions involved in the strike, which was the National Union of Miners, NOM, and AMCU, which is the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, and also the role of the South African Police Service. Originally, the commission was also tasked to look at the role of, uh, of the government which is the Department of Mineral Resources and other government agencies, which would have implicated the uh, Minister of Police. But a few years into the commission, Jacob Zuma intervened and took that task out of the commission. So the commission was prevented from ever being able to ascribe criminal liability to anybody in the government. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the findings of the commission. Suffice it to say that, um, you know, Ronnie Caswell's the uh, intelligence director on the movie, um, what he was afraid of came to pass, which was that the commission said that everybody was to blame. AMCU, Lanmin, South African Police Services, uh, NOM, everyone was equally to blame. And basically what they said was, you know, um, it's the position that Cyril Ramaphosa took which is blame everyone so that no one is really to blame, if that makes any sense. Just kind of point the finger at everyone. And also the commission ascribed, it recommended to the national prosecutor that the prosecutor investigate criminal liability for the South African police service officers who may have shot some of the workers as well as some of the workers who may have killed other people. Now, um, I mean, it doesn't take a very clever person to know which way the prosecutor is going to go on that one. And also, the, um, the workers were not, the government did not pay for the legal representation for the workers during the commission hearing, so their lawyers had to work for free. Yeah. Was there any antagonism among the workers, or were they just at all, you know, significant? Or were they turning it around? There was antagonism between the workers. And actually, in one of the scenes in the movie, they don't say it outright, but like the workers, the, the mine workers, the rock drillers, were actually going to one of the mine sites in order to attack scabs. So there was conflict oh, between. Yeah, that, that, that so, to right. me is another. Thank you. Right. Much. Okay. So I'll, I'll get to that later, though. Um, okay. So I'd like to touch on some background issues and also a few of the key issues during what happened as the strike evolved. Um, so before the strike in Marikana, um, there was a wave of increasing militancy among the mine workers in the Rustenburg area. In the early period of 2012, there was a wildcat strike, or what South Africans call an unprotected strike, over at the Impala mine, um, where the police did intervene and uh, the miners won a increase in wages from 4,000 rand, which is about $500 a month, to 9,000 rand, which is approximately $1,100 a month. Um, a guy called Julius Malema, 
who used to be the head of the ANC Youth League, who had been expelled from the ANC recently, intervened in the Impala strike and took credit for the wage increase that the workers had won. So that's what happened in the immediate like prehistory of like what happened at Maricona. Um, in May to June of 2012, a delegation of miners met with Lonmin management. They were not affiliated with any of the unions that were there. And they delivered a wage increase request for 12,500 Rand, which would have come out to be about $1,500 a month. The Lonmin manager who met with them said, well, okay, I'll take your request under advisement. Um, I can offer you guys not a wage increase, but like a one-time allowance. And he took that request to the Lonmin Executive Council, of which Cyril Ramaphosa is a member. And they came back with a lower wage demand than he requested. And sometime between May and June and August, the Lonmin Executive Council reached um, a decision, which was a negotiating position throughout the strike, that they would not negotiate with the workers unless the workers went through the NOM, the National Union of Mine Workers. Um, so the other union was completely sidelined. Um, I think the movie does a pretty good job of going through the events after the strike broke out, like um, from August 10th until August 16th. Basically, the strike was non-violent. The workers were not armed until August 11th, when the NUM <coughs> officials attacked the marching workers and uh, shot two of them. The movie says they died, but actually um, they were just hospitalized. They didn't die. They were lost or what? The movie says that they died, the two workers who were shot by the NUM people, but they didn't actually die. They were just critically wounded. Um, and after that point, um, the situation escalated and the miners armed themselves and the whole sequence that you guys saw happened um, up to August 13th, which is when you saw that confrontation with the general, like telling them they had to lay down their weapons, and then they marched off, and then the police fired tear gas at them, and then five people died. And that's when the police got the photos of the two police who were killed, and you know, the situation just went out of control from that point. So on the 14th of August, um, a guy called Colonel Duncan Scott was responsible for developing the operational plan for the police. And the plan that he developed had six phases. Um, like the only phases that got implemented were phases <coughs> one, two, three. Phase one was negotiation, right? You develop a police line, don't arm them keep the barbed wire behind the police line and just have people going to up to the strikers to negotiate with them. Phase two was escalation. You move the barbed wire up between the police line and the strikers. You move the tactical force, I think, tactical police force up to the front line. And um, phase three was what eventually became known as the tactical option, which was to encircle the copy, the hill, with barbed wire and uh, create one exit point. It's kind of like kettling. Right? It's kind of like an extreme version of kettling. And then as the strikers went out the exit, you would disarm them. All right? So that's what the plan allegedly was, but that's not what the police were actually doing. All right? So um, we know what the police were planning because um, it's mentioned in the movie, but there was an audio recording of a conversation between Bernard uh, Makona and the South African Police Service, I think it was the Northwest Province Commissioner, who was called Zukizwa Mbombo. And I'm actually a little bit puzzled why the movie didn't go into this. And the only explanation I can come up with is that Rihad Desai, the filmmaker, was didn't want to put anything, any non-direct evidence into the movie because he was afraid he would get like sued or something like that. But the best evidence for what the police were actually up to is in that transcript. Um, they, Lonmin and the police conspired to make phase one a farce. They were gonna like fake the negotiation and let the miners think that they were doing well. And then Lonmin was gonna airdrop um, flyers that demanded that they return to work. 
and then the police were going to use that as an excuse to escalate to phase two and phase three. And, you know, there's all sorts of quotes from that conversation, like, you know, this will be the D-Day when we do this, and if the strikers don't listen to us, like, there will be blood. Um, but the, the political um, motivation is also in that recording, so I'd like to read a page from that to you guys to kind of show you what's happening. Okay, so um, Mbombo says, you will clear yourself by ensuring that you defuse, you give out information that is related to this thing, and we are actually able to act on that information, meaning airdrop the flyers so that we can make our demands to disarm, okay? Oh, and I forgot to say, another thing that they talked about was the police were concerned because during the Impala strike, management ended up negotiating with the strikers, so they wanted to make sure that Lon Min did not uh, take a soft line on the strikers. They were saying, we're concerned your shareholders are going to take a soft line, so we need you to take a hard line and drop those flyers. Okay, so that's what happened immediately before this, right? Okay, so Makona says yes. Uh, Mbombo says, when I was speaking to Minister Mathethu, the Commissioner of Police, Minister of Police, he mentioned a name to me that is also calling him, that is pressurizing him. Unfortunately, it is politically high, Mr. Makona. It is Cyril. Mbombo, Cyril Ramaphosa, yes. Now remember now when I was talking to the National Commissioner, Ria Piega, last night she says to me, look, General, what are those Lamin shareholders here? So I said, I don't know the shareholders, but I do know when I spoke to the minister, he mentioned Cyril. And then she says, now I got it. You know why she says she got it? Remember Cyril was in the appeal committee of Nalema, remember? Makona, yes. Um, Mbombo, and he was very strong in terms of his decision that was made. He took a hard line expelling Nalema. Makona, yes. And remember that at Impala, Milemas came with our premier and spoke to those people about that they should make their demands, but in a way that, and after we ourselves as the police, we managed to, you know, manage the decision after Milema came. Now, our decision with the National Commissioner was around this thing, and uh, we want it so that if Milema comes and defuses this thing, we don't want it so it becomes as if Milema has taken charge of the mine. Makona, yes. Once again, remember Malema's view that the mine should be, Makona, nationalized. Mbombo, nationalized and all of that. So it has got a serious political connotation that we need to take into account, but which we need to find a way of diffusing. Hence, I just told these guys that we need to act such that we kill this thing. Makona, immediately, yes. Mbombo, when tomorrow we have to move in, if today we do not find cooperation in these people, we need to move in such that we kill it, because we need to protect a situation where any jick and jiff from a political area. So that's the explanation of what was happening. The upper tiers of the ANC wanted the police to stop the strike whatever, by whatever means necessary, but basically with force, because they needed to end the strike before Malema came on site. And, you know, we can argue about whether Malema was going to nationalize the mines or not. I don't think that he would have. But the point is that the ANC was concerned about a political threat from its left intervening in the situation. Okay, so on August 15th, um, there was a decision taken at an extraordinary meeting of the Police National Management Forum. And uh, this only came out later on in the hearings, but essentially what happened at this meeting is that the South African Police Force made the decision to go to phase three immediately, all right? During the commission hearings, they claimed that they actually made the decision to go to phase three at like two in the afternoon on the 16th after they saw that the situation was escalating. And in order to show that, they faked evidence, they deleted crucial documents, all of their witnesses lied, and uh, they also pretended that this meeting of the National Management Forum never took place. And the only reason anybody knows about it is because an unknown third party contacted the commission and said, ask them about the extraordinary meeting of the National Management Forum. And then when they were put on the spot, they couldn't fake it anymore. And then they put pressure on one of the police witnesses who gave up a whole bunch of documents. Um, so what happened was they had the regular meeting, and then at the end of the meeting, Ria Piega 
told all the non all the administrative staff to leave so only the command staff were remaining and they also got rid of the minute taker there was a recording made of what happened at that meeting and now they're trying to find out by basically putting all the upper level police people on subpoena what actually happened and it's possible one of them might break but um, we don't have the audio recording anymore because the, per the police, you know, high-ranking person who had it deleted it. Um, and the decisions that were made at that meeting that we know of were that they would go to phase three on the 16th, that they would order 4,000 rounds of R5 semi-automatic um, ammunition, and that they would order the mortuary vans. So that's why on the 16th, when you look at the video, like it already looks like they're getting ready to like basically like shoot all the miners, right? Because they were. It was the decision was made on the 15th. It wasn't that in the afternoon they went, okay, now we got to make the decision, right? They were going right. to kill them the day before. So right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's more I could say about the police cover-up, but I mean, essentially, like, you know, they just lied throughout the commission. The commission at one point suspended hearings, you know, and uh, wrote actually a letter saying, you guys are lying, which was pretty extraordinary. And they also, like, you know, right after the massacre, they had, like, a nine-day, like, retreat at a place like uh, Pontchef Stroom um, in order to, like, orchestrate this whole cover-up. So, um... Yeah, I could talk about the Ramaphosa emails, but um, I think the movie covered that pretty well. Um, okay, so to finish, um, earlier I'd said that there was a conspiracy at the highest levels of the ANC government to kill the strikers. But I think we need to be a little bit more specific and apply some Marxist analysis to what was going on. Right? Um, there were two unions at Maricano, right? There was AMCU and the NOM. Right? One union was more militant, um, the workers were tending towards that union, the other union was pro-management. Right? Like it's a pretty common situation in many workplaces. And management refused to negotiate with the militant union and they only wanted to deal with the pro-management union. That's a normal situation, right? What made Maricana different is the pro-management union, the norm, was closely tied in with the state power the ANC, because the NUM was the union, one of the most militant unions in the drive to end apartheid, and Cyril Ramaphosa had built it up in the 1980s, right? So it was an instrumental part of the South African state, and the ANC, in order to preserve its power, had to maintain its hegemonic position in the workplace, right, by maintaining the dominance of the NUM. So that's the thing that made Marikana happen that the conflict between these two unions was kind of escalated and made particularly toxic by the fact that the state power was involved and the ANC felt that it had to maintain control in order to keep its position as the defenders of capitalism in South Africa. So, yeah. Um, you know, what should we do about that? Um, I, you know, it won't surprise you. I think you guys have all heard this before. The workers need a revolutionary party, and it needs to be based on a political program that's capable of displacing capitalism in South Africa. Um, you know, I mean, the devil's in the details. I mean, you know, many of us have different opinions on how that should be done. I happen to be a Trotskyist, so I believe that that program should be based on the transitional program of the Fourth International. Thank you. Thank you. Really. There's, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and seeing the film. Part of the reason that we, of Optic Illusion, we are the video collective here at Omni, wanted people to see this film, see, is because we hope that, uh, you know, people begin to see our film series as a serious film series, as a place where you can come to be educated about what's going on in this planet. We have already shown the film 1971, which was a film about a group of anti-war protesters that broke into the FBI's office, stole their files, and through that, Hoover's COINTELPRO program was exposed. Yeah. 
which in turn led to the church commission, two FBI agents going to prison, and the fact that we today know what the government did in the case of Fred Hampton and so many others. We also showed a film called Flag Wars, an excellent film that shows the ugly details of gentrification, what it really means on the ground. It was, <coughs> excuse me, it was produced by the woman that made the film Citizen Four. And, and you know, she made, this was an earlier film by her. So that's the kind of stuff and you see what we showed you today. My task right now is just to share with you a little bit of the information that those of us who have been working in solidarity with the unions in South Africa are trying to do. We think that this is not specific to South Africa. We think that this is something that could happen right here in America. I'll tell you why. Many of you may not be aware of it, but they done broke us down like a shotgun. 40% of the American workers work for the minimum wage. I did not know that until I checked the statistic. That's what they've done to us. Besides breaking our unions, at one point, we know we had 35% of the American workers were members of unions. Today, less than 11% and going down. You can bet there's only so far workers can go. They're going to fight back, believe me. But without leadership, trusted leadership, proven leadership, this kind of scenario can unfold. Because these workers, this was spontaneous from the base. This was just raw hatred of their super exploitation. Today, in America, our workers are being, a section of our workers are being super exploited. Let me please explain. 25% of the workers that I described earlier receive some form of state welfare, like food stamps, okay? 25%. I would like to submit to you, given that these, these benefits have been cut to the bone, that the class struggle, now hidden, now open, will have to reemerge in this country simply for people to leave. Children go to bed hungry in this country. When the workers begin to fight back, I'm afraid they may not have a sophisticated leadership, a proven leadership. So you will see something much closer to what we just saw. And do you have any doubt that these pigs will shoot our brothers down like dogs? I'm not trying to scare you just trying to get you to think. Now, this problem of super exploitation, let me see if I can explain it so you can get it real quick. Every worker that works for a capitalist is exploited. That is to say, the capitalist receives surplus value from the labor of that worker. But, under quote, normal circumstances, the worker is paid enough to reproduce himself. That is, to have a roof over his head, to buy clothing, to feed his children, etc. And to actually have some money left over for leisure. Maybe go to a movie or something. When people are paid so low that they can't pay their rent alone, that is not normal exploitation. The capitalists have been exploiting workers in the third world now for, more, for centuries, okay? Let's just be clear. That is, they intentionally pay people at a rate that they cannot feed themselves, so they have to take to other methods to raise the funds to live. That's a fact. That's why these brothers fight so intensely. And that is what is happening in this country. I see our young people huddled up in one-bedroom apartments with six people. That's right, right here in this city, right in front of your eyes. We are being super exploited by the capitalists here. We are going to fight back. It will not be orderly. It probably won't be very neat, but it's going to happen. And, you know, just 
from there. So you understanding that super exploitation is exploitation that goes beyond simply the normal exploitation between a capitalist employer and an employee. And we're beginning to see it here in America. So the problems of the relationship between these national liberation movements before they assume power and the rare cases uh, of them actually winning power has been a has been legend. It's been a problem for a long, long time. The most classic might be the the Kuomintang in China, where you had a situation where the Kuomintang started by who Sun Yat Sen, a liberal, right, and it grew enormously and began to engage and fight against the warlords for supremacy in China. But what happened? Well, the Kuomintang, actually, through its leader, Chiang Kai-shek, turned on the working class. And this was evidenced in 1927. In China, there was a massacre at the heels of the Shanghai General Strike. They killed 27,000 workers. This was a major, I mean, it makes a slaughter like this look like nothing. But this is the history of these nationalist formations when they come to power. Now, I would like to bring to your attention the following, and this is not, I'm not saying this to prettify Mandela, but I think, I think we should know that Mandela in his address to the 1993 Cosado Congress said to, the, uh, to thunderous applause, and this is a quote, if the ANC does to you this is, Kosatu was, is the Labor Federation in South Africa. Mr. Mandela said, if the ANC does to you what the apartheid government did to you, then you must do to the ANC what you did to the apartheid government, to thunderous applause. How could Nelson Mandela, the leader of the ANC, make such a remark? Because he knew his lecherous comrades very well. And it winds up, unfortunately, that that little statement, that little skeptical statement, unfortunately, points the way forward in South Africa. So what I've wanted to mainly share to you, they mentioned it in the film, a wave of strikes occurred across the South African mining sector right after this, after this massacre. So often, when our brothers are mowed down like that, brothers and sisters mowed down, that's the end of the struggle. But where do you go when your back is already to the wall? Where can you go? Well, <clears throat> as early as October, analysts estimated that approximately 75,000 miners were on strike from various gold and platinum mines and companies across South Africa. Most of them, of course, illegally. Citing failure of workers to attend disciplinary hearings, on the 5th of October 2012, Anglo-American Platinum, that's a, a newspaper for the miners, for the mining owners, the world's biggest platinum producer, announced that it would fine 12,000 people. It said that it, it would so, it would do so after losing 39,000 ounces of output or 700 million rand. And, excuse me, uh, Andy, can you tell me, or, uh, seven rand to a dollar, right? No, about 12 rand to a dollar. These days, okay. So they, but clearly they were losing money due to the strike. Uh, uh, it might have been then, about 10 rand and 12 now. Okay. The a, all right, so the ANC Youth League expressed anger at the company and pledged solidarity with those who had been fired. This, so this struggle, believe it or not, led to a, a kind of a, a strike fever in that whole mining district. And it started to swell, and, and other people began to go on strike. The final resolution entailed the miners uh, working at the lowest depths, earning between 10 rand from the previous 8 rand. A winch operator now earns 10 rand up from 8 rand. A rock drill operator would earn about 12 rand from 9 rand and a production team leader would earn about 13 rand from the 11 rand that he earned before. 
The return to work on the 20th of September coincided with the last day of the COSATU conference in Johannesburg. At the same time, it was reported that un an unnamed number of strikers left the unions that had previously represented them. We're talking about noon. So people are leaving the National Union of Miners. It's very disorderly. They're joining the other union. is becoming the majority union. The Maricana Miners pay deal was increased between 11 to 22 percent, as it says in the film. Now, I want to tell you something. A 22 percent increase in pay is not something that American workers have been winning lately. I support all the struggles here I, I can find and engage with, and I, I'm obviously 3 percent increases while inflation is running away. So it is not a minor thing that some of these brothers got, you know, a 20% increase. Along with one of us, the, the bone, they gave the one-off bonus as uh, Richard had talked about. The struggles undertaken by the miners since January of 2012 had an echo in various other sectors. So as I mentioned, the bus drivers went on strike, teachers went on strike. Uh, you had the farmers start to go on strike. That got really ugly. Uh, you know, you had a certain thing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I have to mention this one. The, uh, these, this one group of workers really got tired of this, the owner of the farm, so he ceased to live. And they just kind of stepped over his body and just left him there for six months. No, no love lost between labor and capital in South Africa. Okay, starting in June, they, there would be negotiations. And to, to make it, what does this all mean? that in spite of what I'm trying to really impress upon you is that in spite of this the brutality and the viciousness of the state, this strike grew. More people went on strike. And it's not like they didn't know what had just happened. Which shows you the relative, the relative difference between our struggle here, which is about to get a little more intense, I believe, and what we have seen in South Africa. The constitution of elected organs of coordination, and this is, the, this is one of the more inspiring moments of the strike. What we did, our little committee, is we tried to help the strikers there as best we could. How do they have a meeting, you know? They had to rent stadiums to have meetings. So when we had Mazibuku here, we would have a function like this, collect money, take the money, send it to South Africa so that the workers could coordinate their activity, okay? That's what we did, and that's what we will continue to do with your help. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming out and just understand what class struggle is really about. And even the most vicious and cruel capitalist slaughter cannot stop the class struggle. Thank, Thank you for listening. Oh, sure, we have discussion. Uh, this gentleman, Alex, please, and then please try to speak for about three minutes, let everybody go. get in. So we can hear you. I just have two questions for anyone who might know. Um, first question, in the film, the Alku um, president, I believe, spoke to the workers and the workers were leaving the, that hill or the mountain. And maybe I missed it or something, but why were they leaving? And my sense is that it was in order to move forward the negotiation, so maybe I'm wrong. So I'm curious about that was we'll have an assessment of whether or not it was like a, what, what type of question that was, and that was a speculation in that case, or what people in South Africa are saying about that. And then my second question is around the migrant um, people who were here was part of the Democratic left front in South Africa. So I'm curious what role the Democratic left front played in trying to spread the strike or supporting the strike um, or leading the strike perhaps um, or any of the other strikes that happened. Okay, just to answer, I'd like to answer your second first and then I would like to have Richard answer your first question. Uh, I'll, I'll just, you know, the Democratic left front is not, in my opinion, a unified Leninist type organization. It is, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, well, I don't know what to call it. It, it. People with different opinions, but are to the left of the ANC, kind of joined together in this group. So their role, what they did, I thought was honorable, is that uh, they weren't very big, 
but they just went right to the working class districts and supported the workers. What do you guys need? So the guy said, look, we we, we want to have a meeting. Well, you can't meet in a, uh, a union hall with 2,000 people, 20,000 people, 10,000 people. So we worked to help the Democratic Front send, we sent them money so that they could rent stadiums. That kind of support work is mostly what I see the Democratic Left Front did. Which day are you talking about, Alex? The day of the the day of the massacre. I think that what happened. I think that what happened was that Mambush had told um, the miners that they should leave because he saw that the escalation was happening. And then some of them. Well, I think like a thousand of them left when Joseph Mathunjwa came over and said, you know, when he knelt down and said, please leave. You know, like the situation is really bad. Some of them left then, and then um, Mambush wanted the rest of them to leave. And that's when the massacre happened. Is that does that answer your question? No, sir. They were betrayed. See, the company said to them the day before that if they surrendered their weapons and go, went home, that they would negotiate the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. The company Laman changed their mind and said, "Fuck that! We're gonna kill these motherfuckers." No, they, they never they never actually changed their mind. That was the plan from the get go. Okay, I'm sorry. They were never going to like. I mean, you know, Lumman didn't care. Lumman didn't care whether they were arrested or they were killed, as far as I can tell from all the evidence. But their thing was like, you know, you guys are going to be arrested one way or another. Like we don't care if you're disarmed or not. So they dropped the flyers. It didn't happen on the 15th. It happened on the 16th. The morning. They just dropped them from a copter or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then the police came. Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, just in terms of my understanding of the history. First, the rock drillers were separated by a double tier pay from the rest of the miners by their own union. They were sidelined and betrayed. The rock, rock drilling is the most dangerous job and the most difficult job. Many of them do not come back up after a day's work. They die down there, they're buried, they're this or that. So that's number one. Number two, they went, before they formed AMCU and went to it, they went to NUMSA, the National Union of Metal, what's the metal, metal? The National yeah, Union. Yeah, the metal union that now America. is not supporting the ANC. A quarter of a million, 350,000, and they went to them to ask them to organize us. And Dinga told us when he was here, Unfortunately, we didn't do it. Then that opened the door to AMCU. Okay, so that's number one. And AMCU was dealing with wildcat strikers. Another thing that should be mentioned, they showed Senzeni Zokwana, who was president at that time of NUM, and third in command of the SACP, the South African Communist Party. <laughs> Let me just finish. He first accused the AMCU, these people that marched on the NUM headquarters and were fired on, as starting the violence. Later, he rescinded this. He said, I withdraw my accusation. What they initiated was a demonstration. That was not in this film, and it's tragic. Now, I want to also mention that Soquana gets a million four hundred thousand rand a year, four hundred thousand, which comes directly from the company down there. They call it second month. Same thing with Baleni, also NUM, also uh, a big opera, a general secretary at, at that time of the Communist Party. He also makes a million four hundred thousand rand a year. The workers were asking for who, well, please. From who? Who gives this man a million dollars? The union and 400,000 comes from directly from the bank controlled by the company. Those are called second months. So a million bucks salary plus 400,000 bonuses from the banks that are tied to the company. And he is the one told the workers, moderate your demands. They're asking for one ninth or one tenth of what he makes and he's got the nerve to tell them to moderate their demand. Now, they never got the 12,500 immediately. Yeah. There's a lot more to talk about a lot in this case that shows, first of all, you cannot split the chain of command of police from their own government. Time is up. Time is up. Excuse me, does anyone else want to make a statement or ask a question? Yeah, a couple of things. 
You, you want to speak in? Please. Well, first up, I would not talk about Malema as opposition from the left. I think that is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Malema arrived... Explain to them who Malema is. Yeah, who's yeah. Malema? Malema is with the... Uh, uh, the uh, economic freedom, freedom front. economic parties. freedom front, or the everything for free party. That's sort of sometimes people <laughs> take a bit of a crack on that one. But it's a pop he's a populist. Uh, takes off his gold watch and his Rolex and everything. Arrives at the, uh, there, and he picks up. Uh, uh, he arrives. At the, that's why they didn't want him to come up there to the to the second minor minor strike, which was a point he was uh, making because. Uh, as a populist, he you know he he piggybacks on uh, he piggybacks on people's pain and 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 he's gaining mileage and he's a thorn in the side of the uh, ANC. But uh, there was uh, uh, a uh, a sort of a convention of uh, various parties and groups discussing uh, how to deal with the ANC uh, to create an opposition to the ANC. <laughs> In this was the Pan-Africanist Congress, in Carter Freedom Party, who are known conservatives, uh, uh, Malema, and who was the end of Zappo. So, uh, you know, and one of the discussions that's going on now is that uh, NUMSA have had some talk with Malema, and, uh, and to me that's bloody frightening. But uh, the other thing is that Malema came back and said, you need, uh, you need uh, people to join your union uh, and me membership. We can send, we will send you membership, but don't you start a political party. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm hoping that bloody Numsa does start a political party because I think that's the only bloody shot at the moment. Although other things will shape up. Okay, thank you. Mm. Is there anyone out? Yes, ma'am. I want to throw this out. Maybe it doesn't tie together. What, what happens, what is going on is a huge Aboriginal population that was assimilated a lot, pressed in Australia. Is there any parallels to be drawn? We don't talk about Australia a lot, but I have a feeling and it been gnawing at me, and I'm bringing it up here for a comment, or a, you know, just not to, to fill it out, but to bring it up. Would anybody speak to this? She's talking about the Aboriginal people of Australia. Go ahead, man. <laughs> Were you listening? Uh, yeah. Couldn't understand. Yeah. She, she, Drawing parallels. What? Drawing a parallel. To what? To South Africa? No. There is no parallel. What? It's a different continent. Well, not just a different continent. It's a different social dynamic. And that is to say that in South Africa, here's what's really different. You, you, to, to, I'm going to take a stab at it, right? <laughs> and that is that the South African proletariat is absolutely necessary for, for the South African capitalists to, to accrue the super profits that they make. The same is not true of the Aboriginal people in um, in Australia and in New Zealand. Now, they're not like the, the heart of the economic machinery of the country, in my opinion. They're terribly impressed. Well, I mean, what do you refer to? The Aboriginal people in Australia have no voice, no... No, I'm not talking about that. It's about voice. I'm talking about what economic role they play in the country. In the country. But their economy. role is... They are Aboriginals, that's their role. No, no. Okay. you don't even understand what we're no. talking about. It's okay. We'll talk to you about it later, okay? okay. No. Because the fact of the matter is, they, I mean, you know, they certainly, there's no question that they're not oppressed. They're and, oppressed. And, and one can see a role that's similar, let's say, between Indian, what people that call the indigenous people in the United States Indians, and the Aboriginal people in Australia. There's a little bit more of a per parallel. but. The, the proletariat, these people that are being murdered today, they're the heart and soul of the South African economy. Okay. They make the economy go. I have a question for you. You said they're heart and soul because these people are, are, are they work in the mines of South Africa, is that correct? 
Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are they working for? Money. Stay alive. Money. No, they, no they're, they're working to, to, to produce, what is it, what is it diamonds or what, what, what is it? Platinum. Platinum. Gold. Gold. No, no, platinum. Gold. 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 Manganese. Gold. Platinum. Whatever natural, you know. natural, whatever natural essence that exists in South Africa, they go into the mines to produce it. Yes, to yes. extract it, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, their, and, their, and their, their problem is, is that they're dying to produce this, this, these essence. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. In part. Right. They, in they, part, die, yeah. they die every day to produce stuff that's produced for these people who are who are the capitalists. There's no comparison to what's basically in Australia. These people don't work for the Australian government. They just exist as aborigines. No. Not, no, not, it's not quite true. Okay, so what, 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 what work do they do? Well, well, that's kind of that's the argument that's that he depends. was making earlier on. Right, right. Look, look. Actually, Aborigines do have. They do work, believe it or not, but they have slaughtered so many of them and exterminated well, they don't them. They don't work in mines, brother. Listen, that's his point. That's his point. That's the point I made. Is that the the number in society is not commensurate, and the social weight that they therefore have is not commensurate with the South African proletariat because that's what that was the original question. Could we I don't mind talking about the Aborigines, but I'd like to bring it all back to what we were trying to talk yes, about that is South Africa. Yeah. Can I just yeah. 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 some other people Hang on, this guy's been waiting to speak forever it's in the day. One, it's just a yeah, 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 behind the line. More and come up with no one should speak twice until everyone who wants to speak spoke one. Go ahead man. I was really struck in the film by the level of technical and tactical organization of the police. And the, the I was just personally struck by the overwhelming magnificence of their armament. And here we have miners who use technical machinery. We don't see them with their means of production. We see them just completely alone and they don't have no means of production. They go down, down to the Hold on, blood, blood, blood. Don't interrupt. Let the brother please. speak, please. He, he let you speak. Bullshit. Wait a minute, bro. That, that may be your opinion. But let him speak. If you don't want to participate, okay, you, can, you can leave. Back. Go ahead. Man. I think a rock driller uses a drill to drill the rock. They're extremely um, technically able men who are, who are placed in a condition of extreme privation. And it's just. I just wanted to say that it's remarkable the amount of production that goes into the police armaments. And I was I was just astounded at the echo between that and the armaments we saw last August in Ferguson and what we saw in the streets of Oakland. It's just astonishing the degree of technical excellence. And it's, uh, it's, I would one day like to see a psychological or sociological study on that and how it seduces the sport brothers in police uniforms who, Not brothers. you know, are com completely traitors to, to the cause. Okay. Can I, can I just, can I just, can I just no, you don't have to speak to every question. Thank you very much for your Go ahead, man. Yeah. Lucia, go ahead, London's rolling it. I mean, kind of, it seemed like London was kind of had a role in this. They own it, they own it. London. 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 Although it is English. Okay. Loneman is owned by, oh, Loneman, you meant. Loneman. Oh, Lundman. yeah. The Loneman mine. The mine English is called Loneman. Oh, Loneman. Loneman. Loneman, but it is, Br it's a British hey, company called Loneman. Yeah. Okay, Richard, did you have a, a breakdown of uh, some sort of analytical reply? A breakdown of what? Uh, and you, you wanted to say something back to what I... Uh, yeah, but well, we yes, want but as many I mean, other yeah, people to speak. Let's speak and then we'll get back to some of the things. Um, yes, sir. I have a simple factual question. So is it illegal for the miners to be um, holding whatever weapons they may have had? So, I mean... I'm, I'm just yeah, curious legal of, some sort of, of course, that yeah, was their was. pretext. If you look... Here these cats had these little sticks with yeah. a knife on the end of it. I it was quite and wait a minute, wait a minute. Now let's look at what's going on. They got a stick with a knife taped to it. And these other people got AR-15s. Come on. Look, let's let's not 
allow ourselves to to sink to that type of stupidity. It is really clear that there was no match between the possibility of these miners to inflict any harm on these police and these cats. That's the point we're trying to make right now about the military. This gentleman is absolutely correct, by the way, when he talks about the militarization of who? Of American police. Those same, when you see those vehicles, those are the same vehicles that they bring to your house now to deliver a warrant. I don't understand the point. Well, you might not ever. No, I don't, no, I don't ever. Please, sir. Please, sir. Don't interrupt, please. No, 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 no. Excuse me, sir. You will get your chance no. to speak. But we can't speak at the same time. No, if you, you don't want to hear it, leave. Simple mouth. Yeah, all right. That's enough, sir. But look it. Anybody else got something? Let, let everybody that wants to speak get, get it. Respond to your point on the round. You can, you can speak to this thing. Okay, all right. Let me just respond to your point first. Um, the thing, yes, it was illegal. And what it reminded me of is Occupy is Occupy because when they destroyed the Occupy encampments, they used public health as a pretext, right? They were like, we have to clean these encampments. These encampments are unhygienic. That's why we have to bring the police in and destroy everything. So, you know, I see it as the same thing. But yes, like they defined it as being illegal. And actually, that's one of the things that Cyril Ramaphosa was responsible for in those emails. He actually said, this is a criminal act and not a labor dispute. And the reason he went to the trouble to do that is because labor is because strikes are protected under South African law. You can't use the police on a strike. So when he went and you know like got in the meeting with the minister of mines and said this is a criminal act da 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 da. The whole point of him telling her that, even though he doesn't like come out and say it, is well shoot them, right? So, yeah. um, do you want to go? Just to respond real quick. In South Africa, also, it's part of the culture, part of the the, the singing, the that's dancing. Right, that's it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a warrior dance, you know. It's also it, it's also that that's a whole other aspect of it. why it would be normal, or you know, most South Africans would not think that these, you know, it's not. <laughs> It's not a war, you know, in terms of, yeah. I actually learn something new every single time I watch this film. And one of the things that I noticed this time was, you know when they're marching towards that general and they're like singing and they're marching like one step at a time? I realized that what that song is for is to give people courage as they're advancing towards heavily armored police. Because I remember during Occupy when the police were like kettling us and stuff like that, it was terrifying, you know? So yeah, that's what it's for. Yeah. Um, can I just respond to Isaac's point real fast? Go ahead, right. but the other gentleman wants to speak too. I, I, just, I just wanted to say real fast, like, I mean, I actually don't agree with your characterization. I think, well, the police were heavily armed, but I think that they were incompetent, bumbling, and really badly organized, you know. And, you know, that's, that's in large part why the massacre happened. They couldn't even encircle the, the hill properly. You know, and then like they just opened fire in order to like fix the situation. Perhaps I should just observe that the equipment was overwhelmingly. Yes, right. The equipment. Yeah. Was oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Well, it was a requisition by the government. Okay, before we now we're getting into double conversations. I see the gentleman over here, followed by the gentleman in the black T-shirt. Please. Movement against the genocide. Let the other gentleman speak too. Oh, I was just going to just mention the tactical situation. I understood that the mine workers had mostly just sticks, not carries they called them, and, and, and machetes or tongues, but there were a couple of guns and apparently 
some journalist does say that one, one gun was discharged on the mine workers' uh, side, but most of the mine workers, it turned out, were shot in the back. The, um, the police claimed that they were charged by the, uh, the mine workers, but as you saw from the film, they were, you know, they planned to clear them out and they encircled them, so, and they fired tear gas, so a lot of those people were just panicked, they didn't know exactly where they were going, so, you know, and since they were, you know, surrounded, you know, uh, uh, you know, it may have seemed like they were being charged, but, you know, the Battle of Rourke's Drift in 1879, when 4,000, you know, uh, Zulu warriors with spears and training and stuff deliberately attacked about 150 British soldiers with single shot rifles. They were they were massacred. You know, they could, these guys didn't have a chance against all those, you know, automatic weapons. They were mostly copies of Galil, the Israeli assault rifle. All right, to just to try to deal fairly with the comment that the brother made, I would just say this. I would say that following the death of the young man in Florida, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, Trayvon. Uh, the people uh, that started Black Lives Matter set up a social media machinery to get out the word, you know, two people. Then when Mike Brown got killed, the slogan, Black Lives Matter, became very popular. It was, you, you saw it at demonstrations, stuff like that. So now, what do you have? I went to a Democratic Party meeting. It was a, a phony town hall set up by the Democrats, and they thought they could just do as they wish and pretend to have a, a, a town hall and just speak, and the masses wasn't, wasn't feeling it. And they, they got denounced, and people said, we don't want to hear you. We don't want to hear you. This was... Uh, on Telegraph in a, in a black church, like one, about 39th and Telegraph, don't know the name of the church, I'm not much for, good for churches, but that at that church, mm -hmm. I went in and I was shocked, to be honest, because I had never seen such overt hostility from black citizens towards the likes of Barbara Lee, Carson, and these so-called Democratic, uh, Demo, you know, uh, Democratic Party liberals. But if one person said something very interesting, they said, look, if you was going to do any goddamn thing, you didn't have to wait till now to do it. So we don't want to hear from you. We want to hear from each other. That's what the people said, mm -hmm. okay? So this is a, a, a whole thing that, so they, the Democrats talk about Black Lives Matter. We got um, the chief of police of Richmond, California, uh, Chief Magnus, held a sign saying Black Lives Matter. Uh, I held a sign saying in a March, December, you know, saying Black Lives Matter. So a lot of people have uh, been a part of that movement, let's say. Now, the fact is that Black Lives Matter just held a conference uh, two weeks ago in Cleveland, a movement, not a moment, where they're attempting to, they have actually formed organizations. I saw them participating in the one day so-called strike uh, by uh, McDonald's. And they were out there giving coffee and breakfast sandwiches to anyone who would not go into McDonald's. They were there. Black Lives Matter has become an organization. Are they, you know, hopefully, for me, if you want to change society, this, is, this society, eventually your ideas have to penetrate the working class and the people that have their hands on the levers of production that make things go can shut it down. And that's why it's so important that any truly revolutionary group have an orientation towards labor. I, to my knowledge, uh, I'll tell you, I've worked with a group called the Black Workers Organizing Center also, and we did invite um, Garza to speak to the Labor Council. Now, for a number of reasons that, you know, it's a little cagey. But it's not over. So if you think that they should pay some attention to the labor movement, have at it. Um. Okay, first of all, this country is bizarrely rebel that black lives don't matter. Second of all, there is no production that could possibly produce because labor force outsources everything to China. So therefore, 
If there's no work, if there's no work, there's a war. What's being produced here for the war? Nothing. It's outsourced. So if it's outsourced, where does the money go to? Does it stay in the United States? It goes out to, to, to a certain few individuals who produce all the labor force in other countries. And so therefore, people don't have jobs. If people have jobs and the, the police force are there to enforce their effort to kill black people who need jobs. Basically. Okay, uh, let me respond to you because I wanted to say something to you the last time. Um, I wanted to tell you something that this guy from NUMSA said um, when he came over to the Bay Area, I think it was last month or two months ago. What does NUMSA stand for again? The National Man Union of Metal, Metal Workers, Workers of South Africa. Of South Africa. And they are the largest union, I believe, 350,000 plus. Right. Um, so there, I think it was the education director came to the Bay Area, and NUMSA represents the auto plants in South Africa, right? And he told a story about, um, you know catalytic converters, right? Like uh, every American in cars, right? Mm -hmm. The main metal inside catalytic converters is platinum, right? Stolen. Stolen from South Africa. And what he was saying is that the South African workers want to take control of the means of production so they can make sure that every car in South Africa has platinum just like every car in the United States, right? So that South Africa will have clean air just like the United States does. So his point was the struggle of the working class is international and it can only be fought on an international scale that doesn't respect national borders. So if you're talking about like how is it that we're going to solve all the economic problems that are happening because of deindustrialization in this country, the only solution is to go international. We have to organize with the Mexican workers, right? All of right. our work is being outsourced there. That's the only way it's going to happen. It's not Mexico. Mexico is okay. Is India, mm -hmm. right? China. Indonesia. My family These is are in all the countries that produce the goods for America. That's true. These are all countries where everything is created for America. Bicycles are created in China and Taiwan. Okay? Who buys bicycles? The most in the, the whole world. Not China. Man, they drive cars now. Cute. They ride bicycles in China. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. America. Me. They ride bicycles in China. Oh. But everything is everything is made <laughs> in Taiwan. So everything is outsourced. And let the brothers mess this up. It's not even cheap labor no more. Because these people will make money and they house all their people. This country doesn't. Because there's no jobs, there's no housing to support the industry for workers to do anything because there's no labor force whatsoever. There's no clothes made here. Nothing nothing made here for the army. I, I, a guy told me that we spent a million dollars a day for a soldier to be in Afghanistan. But what where does this clothes where does this clothes come from? Not made here. So that is the that is the problem. You know, everything is outsourced Outmaneuvered, not created in America. All we have here is steel. The steel is a big production, but who who who, who do they employ? Okay. Okay. What are we Answer it. Uh, you said it rhetorically, but I don't have any answer. All right. Just wait a minute, because we want to make sure, we want to close it out right. I wasn't Does anybody that has not yet spoken want to share an idea and ask a question? Seeing none, I would like to thank you all for thank coming to our much. film showing. And I'd like to recommend that you sign our, our email list, and we'll let you know. I can tell you right now that the next film we're going to show is going to be the beginning of September and it's called Paris is Burning. Ooh. So we're going to show that film next.
beginning of September. If you give us your email, we will email you as best you know. Thank you very much. Thank you.